The state gets a one-month windfall, but the argument over a progressive income tax goes on. We'll talk about it next on Capital View. Welcome to Capital View, the program where we talk about state issues, sometimes federal issues, and how they just might affect your life. I'm Bernie Schoenberg from the State Journal Register. Legislature is in session these last weeks of May and uh, working hard, we think, uh, to an interesting end we will see. Here to talk about it with me today is Brian Mackey is back, State House reporter for NPR Illinois. Welcome back. Good to be with you as always. And Jeff Rogers is here, Bureau Chief of Capital News Illinois. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming me. back, Jeff. So, Brian, the, there was a actual good news Good news about the Illinois state budget last week for the first time that I can remember in a while. Tell us about it. First time that I can remember <laughs> ever, perhaps, <laughs> since I've been covering oh, it. Oh, back, back in the olden days. 15 be, years for ever, me. But <laughs> you know, 30 years ago, every year, it was like, how are we going to spend the new money that natural growth, come, you know, $500 million every year comes in, and how are we going to spend that, <laughs> was what they did in the session. In all of the recent years that you've been doing this, it's always, what do we have to cut? Yeah. So this is, I think, the... Uh, the way to think of this is you haven't worn that raincoat since last spring and you go in the closet and you reach, you pull out that coat, put it on, reach in the pocket and find $150. <laughs> and that's basically what happened, except for state government, it was $1.5 billion. Right. Uh, about a billion of that was uh, increased tax, income tax revenue. They're still crunching the numbers and trying to figure out exactly why that is. Other states have seen similar bumps. The thinking, current thinking is, is that the good stock market um, maybe people were waiting for a capital gains tax cut. It never materialized. The stock market's been doing great, so people sold off some of their assets and ended up having a higher tax bill. Right, so what we're talking about otherwise. is a one-month year-over-year increase of like one, more than $1.1 $1 .1 billion, right. dollars, and it, they got it, the state took in in April $1.5 billion more than they had projected. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, right, and so office, the uh, big question projected. is, what do we do with all this money now, which right. is not a question people are used to in Springfield. Yes, and the Republicans and Democrats seem to have a different view of this. Yeah, the Republicans' uh, view on that was, well, we've got this extra money. We don't need new taxes now. This is the revenue that we need to be able to balance the budget, so let's let's just stand pat. There's that, that warning out there, though, that this windfall that came in in April might be short-term and might be a one-time thing because of the difference in tax filings um, and the stock market and every, all of that. So it's sort of a be careful because we might, this might not be a trend, this might be a one-time thing, so don't plan on it right. being that way. Right. So it's sort of the debate between those two. Right, arguments. so you had leader of the House Republicans, Jim Durkin, and a couple other state representatives mm -hmm. you, in, a, in a press conference saying not only do we not need uh, the taxes that w and fees that we want to add on this year, like on plastic bags and grocery stores, which I think is only like $20 million statewide, but they want a seven cent or something tax on, on bags. We haven't seen the legislation for that yet, or it hasn't moved through the legislature, certainly. But the whole broader plan of uh, a constitutional amendment uh, for uh, progressive income tax that Governor Pritzker wants that has already passed the Senate but is having some trouble in the House, uh, and, and they were saying, we don't need that in the future either because things are looking brighter. Then uh, you had Senators Toy Hutchinson and Don Harmon the next day come in the press conference room at the Capitol to say, wait a minute, they're talking about uh, all this extra money, but we still have obligations. We still, everything yeah. that we get yeah. is needed. I also got a chance to speak with Comptroller uh, Susana Mendoza. If you go on the Comptroller's website any day and the opening page, you'll see how much money uh, is in the state's backlog. Unpaid bills, mm -hmm. there are still more than $6 billion in unpaid bills. She basically said every dollar is accounted for. Don't count on the windfall for anything. Mm -hmm. Plus, there was a change, Brian, in what Governor Pritzker says he's now going to do about pension payments this year, which is going to ease some minds yeah, about, and, about budgeting. And you don't even have to get to the backlog of bills before this money is already obligated. We were looking at a deficit for this year. We didn't even have enough money to cover the spending we said that state government should do this year. Or which, that the legislature which, which said This it. fiscal year, which ends at the in, end of June. At the end of June, right. And so the, this is where the governor said, well, okay, that problem is solved now with <laughs> this money, and we think that even though this, you know, there are real questions, as, as Jeff said, about whether this is going to continue into the future. It's probably not, but they think it'll continue enough to, as you said, to avoid this um, thing that a lot of fiscally minded people had been looking askance at, which is Governor Pritzker wanted to uh, 
s divert about $800 million that would have gone into shoring up the pensions into operating expenses of the state. And right. a lot and of people said, this is kind of going back. It's not as bad as what R Governor Blagojevich did, but it's like looking like a, it's definitely in the same sports league. It's what Governor right. Blagojevich was doing. This about is the shorting kicking the, the can down the road mm -hmm. by saying we're right. going to extend our pension ramp, which is instead of getting to 90% uh, funding of the pension systems by 2045, we would go to 2052, seven years out in the future. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do that the first year, and there were even some Democrats who said, this is a bad idea, because again, Brian, as you said, that's what we have done before. Well, for every so, dollar you don't put in the system now, it's supposed to be earning interest, so that costs orders of magnitude more down the line. So that's why it, it, it behooves us to save as much as possible yeah. earlier. So it looks like the Republicans and some outside groups still don't like the progressive tax and and don't want new taxes and Democrats say this doesn't change things let's just move ahead as we were and we've got till the end of May or at least scheduled till the end of May when the legislature can pass things without an extraordinary majority other than the constitutional amendment which always takes an extraordinary majority to see if we get it done. Um, one of the other big issues out there is marijuana and it was since the last time we did one of these shows that the full, I guess, 500-page bill mm -hmm. uh, has come out to explain what um, the sponsors of legal recreational use of marijuana in Illinois should look like. Where are we on this one? Brian? Uh, I mean, it's been introduced. This is something that uh, is still... Uh, something that a lot of Democrats seem to want, but maybe not all Democrats, and there are factions within the Democratic Party about how much you go retroactively on criminal justice matters. Do you expunge people who have been convicted of things that will now be legal? Um, and you also have Republicans who are sounding concerns about uh, you know, sending a message to young people that drugs are okay. And also you have law enforcement concerns that there's no real way to test for marijuana impairment right now that will stand up in court. And so they say, if you know, if your loved one is killed in a car accident, mm -hmm. we have no way of really prosecuting mm -hmm. marijuana intoxication. So there are still issues to be worked out. This had been a one of the more interesting things. My colleague uh, had a, Jacqueline Driscoll had an interview with uh, State Senator Jason Barrickman, a Republican mm -hmm. from Bloomington who had been working with the Democrats on this legislation. He says he got a call about the press conference to announce this the night before it was going to happen. And that was up in Chicago. Uh, right, He's with the governor. Mm -hmm. with, with the governor. The governor. Right. Uh, he opted not to go because they couldn't even get him the language, he said at the time. Mm -hmm. And so he says that you know the, the legislation that's out there is not what he thought it would be. And so he's concerned that just as the governor did with minimum wage negotiations earlier this spring, he puts up a show of doing sort of a bipartisan negotiation, but ultimately rams it through on a partisan roll call is how the, the Republicans are framing this might go. But it's well, it's yes. still early in when May. When you talk to We've some of the Democrats, they weeks. say Jason Bergman has been at, at, at their meetings, mm -hmm. and so there's been some conflict of exactly what has been going on because some of the advocates came and I was able to witness, uh, uh, spoke to the editorial board of the State Journal Register about this, uh, Senator Staines, Representative Cassidy, um, Senator Hutchison uh, among them, and, and uh, Jehan Booth, um, uh, or, or Representative, is it? Jehan jo Gordon Booth, yes. Jo Gordon Booth, Jehan Gordon Booth from Peoria, uh, and basically said, uh, you know, we, we have been working, we'll expect some Republican support, uh, and there, there are so many things. One of the interesting things that kind of the, the patchwork or the, the quilt that they painted was people are using this anyway. So many states have gone, are legal. It's out there. If you regulate it, you're actually, you might even lower uh, the usage among youth. Uh, we've got to regulate it. it. They say their main emphasis is not the money, even though the governor has included some money from licensing for marijuana in his budget. Um, you know, and yet you're still seeing a pushback. Marty Moylan is the state representative from the mm -hmm. suburbs who has said, go slow on this, and had a press conference with um, anti-legalization uh, advocates saying it's the wrong message, as you say. So I don't know. Uh, there are so many issues to try to get done by the end of May. How likely is marijuana to be one of them that makes it through? Well, I think that uh, the argument about um, maybe you actually reduce um, the usage by legalizing it, you've, you've got the uh, counter argument that you're actually probably going to see an increase in use in the areas where it's the biggest problem. Um, and that's a concern even for 
um, groups that are looking out for low uh, low income mm -hmm. areas. So that that could be a sticking point. There's so many there's so many different hurdles in this one to get over to a, a, a legislation that I think there can be a consensus on, and it's sort of like maybe the the, the uh, sports gambling. Uh, issue which we might talk about in a little bit too. It's just it's kind of hard to imagine how they bring all of those different yeah. interests and conflicts together before the end of the yeah, session. It is amazing. I mean, Brian was talking about trying to get records expunged uh, right. of people with marijuana convictions from the past. Um, that's one of the things. Speaker Madigan actually mm -hmm. spoke to the public affairs reporting interns on on a, a news conference that they were uh, allowed to have with him on a Monday or had with him on a Monday, and he talked about uh, you know. How do you clear records for certain levels of crimes in the past? Uh, w what's in the bill may go too far in some cases, mm -hmm. and so it looks like the, at least if this goes through the Senate first and gets to the House, there could be changes. It, it sounds like, and it's I mean, uh, you know the law enforcement problems, and as you talked about, you know driving problems and this and that. That's the usual way of things, that there would be changes between the House and the Senate, and uh, I think that this is one of those issues that it would be very difficult to write off before the end of the month. Big picture, big ticket things. I mean, frankly, this seems almost a little early in May for this to be coming to fruition. Uh, y these sort of things usually are negotiated and come down to the wire in the last minute. And uh, if it's going to happen, I would be surprised if it happened before the very end of the month. So we've still got time to watch it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned sports betting. Let's mm -hmm. just get right into that. Uh, I know there was a big hearing on it this week. The professional teams want to be involved mm -hmm. uh, because they say they provide the statistics. They can do marketing, but yeah. no other state gives professional sports teams teams a cut of sports betting. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's now you know, legal to do this, and uh, Representative Zaluski from, uh, is it Riverside or Net Air, mm -hmm. is yeah, trying, to, trying to get this, trying to get a framework done so that mm -hmm. the state can get something and the betting can happen and some profit will go to government instead of all of it going to <laughs> whoever has been running this before, not on the, uh, anyway, mm -hmm. Jeff, uh, is, many different competing interests in that one too. Yeah, well now we've got, uh, I think the latest number is seven different options uh, to consider. It's almost, uh, we've got a field about as large as the uh, Kentucky Derby at this point <laughs> with the, the number of options out there. And you and know that that can end and you don't even yeah. know who really won. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but you know, so it's something that can go through uh, you know, the racetracks and casinos that are there. It's something that can go through the lottery system. It's something um, that you can have the uh, professional sports leagues involved in now. There's discussions about whether it's a uh, um, you're able to do it remotely and on a, like a mobile uh, betting. There's all kinds of different interests at play in this one, and maybe even more so than the the marijuana legislation that we were talking about. It just feels like it's going to be really difficult for them to find a way that they can satisfy all of the different interests, they're not going to be able to, but right. what of those solutions is the best to get to is going to be really difficult, I think. Right, and it's, it comes in the middle of, and I don't even think the casino game, say We haven't even it, talked about yeah. casino expansion and right. Chicago wanting a casino. and Because gambling bills are often like that, and mm -hmm. you know, just to do sports betting. It's similar, I guess, to the marijuana question where the legislators who are advocating for a law say it's happening anyway let's regulate it let's mm -hmm. figure out a structure let's get it done but it's so complicated yeah and, and I, I have not been following this issue as closely as some of my press room colleagues but I did happen to catch the end of a, a hearing this week in the Capitol on this and State Representative Mike Zaleski who's a committee chairman and one of the, the point people on this issue was sounded pretty exasperated and he, he was talking to all the interest groups who were there and said okay you know you've been telling us what you want but you also got to find the votes right because this thing needs votes to pass and that's that's where it's really going to meet the road where mm -hmm. you know you the uh, the Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the White Sox and the Bulls, can bring down uh, Ozzie Guillen was here a couple weeks ago, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Horace Grant, I think, one of the was former her, yes, of, Bulls of, players of, were of here. And, you national know, champions. Okay. I mean, you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, that's not not quite bringing in Pippen or Jordan, <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a deep cut from the I 90s remember Bulls. Horace. But, <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, I mean, you have all these interests lobbying, but ultimately you need 60 votes in the House and 30 votes in the Senate, and that's going to be a, a, a tough, tough, tough road. It seems like any of these issues could, plus a state budget that needs to be passed, uh, they hope by the end of May, it there are all these things coming together. It is an ambitious and agenda this yeah. spring. Yeah. Um, also on the gambling front, there are video gaming machines um, that Pat Quinn approved when he was governor. 
They're not in the city of Chicago right now, but bars and restaurants in Springfield, we actually have the most games and of anybody. stations and everywhere else. That's yeah. right. Uh, <laughs> Some groceries. You have to be, have a little bitty room or mm -hmm. a, a cord in part of the building, and you can have up to five machines, I believe it is. And there are more than, I think, 500 machines in Springfield. Uh, there is a, a, an area along Wabash Avenue in Springfield with like 12 different places that have gambling. So we have our own little aspect. And yet, uh, there is talk of, uh, increasing the take that local governments or that state government gets from those machines and the operators that was one of the bunch of people that came to the state house this last week to lobby to say please you know this is helping our businesses don't take half of our money away or part of our money away well this is one of those things where you have the split where you have yes it does affect individual restaurant owners individual convenience store owners that have put these video gambling machines in and they say if they're uh, you know, if taxes go up, maybe the, their profits will go down or their you know, ability to collect money off of these things will go down. On the other hand, you do have some very powerful interests who, kind of, who are involved in this issue as well. And I think it, one of my favorite statistics, and I've said this on the show before, so apologies for uh, repeat viewers for, for, for those repeating good myself. Watchers, yeah. Yes. But uh, there was a report from the Commission on Government Forecasting and Accountability last fall, an annual wagering report. You know, there are what, 10 land-based casinos in Illinois, and there are enough video gambling machines to be the equivalent of 24 additional casinos. Mm -hmm. So that's how big this is in mm -hmm. the state. And Governor Pritzker has proposed a uh, sort of progressive income tax for video gambling machines. Um, and you know, this is one of those years where despite the windfall in April, uh, lawmakers are still looking to shake as much money out of the couch cushions as they can until uh, they believe they can get the progressive income tax before the voters. In the middle of all this, we're talking, well, President Cullerton appeared with uh, advocates from, I guess, the American Lung Association and, and others pushing for another dollar a pack increase in cigarette taxes. Um, <coughs> I don't know if that's likely this year or not. Uh, his view on that was, uh, you know, this is one tax everybody wants to raise, you know, of health advocates and whatever, and other than I assume some smokers out there who would be paying an extra dollar a pack. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I don't know if they can fit this into in the middle of everything else. It seems to be relatively popular in terms of taxes, uh, how taxes go. I mean, there was a, the uh, um, National Cancer Society, I think, released a uh, study that showed that it was just over 50 percent um, statewide in terms of supporting a um, additional cigarette tax. Once they threw in the question of to help the state budget, I think that went up to about 60% support. So I think that's one of those, the, the sin taxes that generally there's support behind it. So maybe of all of those, that might have the best chance yeah, to get which through. Which is, it's getting very, ex it's already very expensive to buy a pack sure. of cigarettes and yeah. uh, you just keep loading it on. And I guess people who do it like, uh, either must do it or something, uh, despite the fact everybody tells them not to. So um, we will see where that goes. Um, I, in the middle of all this, there is one, it, when you talk about needing more money for state government, one of the agencies that needs more money and that the governor wants to give more money is Department of Children and Family Services. Uh, we have had some very scary statistics, uh, something within the past year, I guess more than 100 children who have had mm -hmm. contact with the agency have died. Uh, there was an audit that came out from Auditor General Frank Martino this last week that showed uh, just some questionable procedures and inaccuracies in reporting, that kind of thing. Uh, there were legislators uh, who had a announcement of a new child welfare caucus. Um, this is something I'm sure everybody wants to get right. The, the governor wants, I think it's 126 new uh, caseworkers, but caseworkers are clearly overloaded. Uh, one of the things that I believe it was the audit showed was that uh, I think it's like nearly half of the people who call the hotline are have to give a message mm -hmm. and we'll call you back. And if you're calling a hotline for a child abuse problem, I don't yeah. think you want to be put on hold or, or you, you have know, to have somebody I, call you back. It's a it, difficult situation. That statistic jumped out at me too. And I asked a uh, physician of my acquaintance uh, who said that, uh, you know, maybe that's not as big a deal. If it's truly an emergency situation, you call 911. Right. And if you call the hotline, uh, this physician said, they're fairly responsive. They do call you back. But it is something where this is a huge problem. There have been a number of high-profile deaths that have gotten a lot of media attention, one in Chicago of a, of a I think, five- or six-year-old boy who was beaten to death Up by his parents. Just a yeah. terrible, terrible yeah. situation. And the, and the parents had reported the child missing and people were searching, and then it turns right. out the parents... Uh, but uh, as you this. said, that is uh, one or at least of more than a... That. 
But I mean, that's one of more than 100 uh, children who have had some involvement with DCFS. And this is, I mean, it's a tough job. A uh, friend of the show, Charlie Wheeler, has said, you know, in his 50 years watching state government, it's probably the hardest job to do in state government is to be a child welfare investigator to make that decision about whether to split up the families. But right. there are... I can't even imagine going mm -hmm. knocking on the door of a right. home where there's been this domestic trouble and saying, I'm here to see if you're, you're a good parent and if right. I should take away your child. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's one, as you said, it's a question of resources. Is there enough money being uh, directed here, enough people? The caseloads are really high. Mm -hmm. There's a court consent decree that says you're only supposed to have 15 cases uh, at, a, at a month or at a time. And some people were as high as 80. So how do, can you possibly manage that caseload? But then there's another policy question where some, some lawmakers want to take a look at the intact family emphasis. Should we be splitting up more families? And in fact, one uh, state representative said she herself had uh, was exposed to opioids in the womb and credits the government taking her away from her birth mother so she could be raised by her grandmother. It says maybe Illinois needs to be doing that more instead of emphasizing keeping families together. It's a yeah. difficult issue. Well, this is one that I'm sure everybody hopes for the same result in this, and I think there's bipartisan support for doing something. It's just very difficult to figure I, out. I, I, in that number, the, the 112 deaths is, is staggering when you hear it, but it's even worse when you realize that's relatively normal um, mm -hmm. for Illinois and for other states um, with their equivalent of the DCFS. And it just shows that um, it's, it's not as, as simple as throwing money at a solution. There's a lot of different ways that they're going to have to approach this to, to make a fix with it. But that number is staggering and it's, it's average, which is, is really depressing. Uh, it is indeed. And we have, well, what is it, more than 12 million people in the state, so it's a big state. But any, any child Certainly. meets a bad end, it, it's a terrible story in itself. Um, so uh, back to something legislative and just a little uh, kind of uh, interesting family politics. Uh, we had an announcement this last week that uh, State Representative Jerry Costello uh, from Southern Illinois, uh, uh, Jerry Costello II, who is the son of a former congressman named Jerry Costello, um, resigned from the House and was named head of law enforcement for Department of Natural Resources. Um, and so that would be an appointment through an agency run by the governor. Uh, and Nathan, Ru is it Reitz or Reitz? Reitz? R Reitz. I think it was Reitz. Reitz. Yeah. Son of former State Representative Dan Reitz was named to replace him uh, <laughs> in that district. So, Brian, give us a little of the political uh, view of this interesting situation. I mean, politics is a family business in Illinois. Yeah. It was ever thus. Uh, and it's one of the, some of the sort of speculation is that this is Governor Pritzker taking a, somebody who is a firm no on a progressive income tax, cannabis legalization, and some other issues, giving them a, a state job uh, so that they are out of the way in the legislature. And presumably, uh, you know, there may have been some vetting of the successor. Yes, and I haven't talked to either of these people myself about this. This, this yeah. just broke shortly yeah. before we started taping this <laughs> afternoon, so we haven't had a chance to do our own reporting. But there is a history of this. Governor Rauner uh, appointed a number of Republicans to government positions. Almost all of them were uh, pro-union in a or, way. Or represented highly union or places like in Or unionized districts, yes. Like uh, uh, representatives Brow former representatives Brower and Poe both got jobs. And Wayne uh, Rosenthal. At, at, yeah. And Wayne Rosenthal. Right. They all represented a lot of state employees who were very, you know, liked government unions or at least understood that their constituents liked government unions and that was a key problem for Governor Rauner at the time and they all mm -hmm. got different jobs and other people got into those those positions. Yeah, so this is not, not all that unusual, but uh, it hasn't, I don't think it's happened as much under Governor Pritzker. Mm, well, interesting, we'll see where it goes. Um, I should mention, um, speaking of family, uh, just a, a sad note, former uh, uh, Cook County Assessor Tom Hines, who was also president of the Illinois Senate, passed away in, in the past week. Uh, he is father of Dan Hines, a former uh, comptroller who is now a deputy governor, uh, overseeing, uh, uh, I think, budgetary issues for Governor Pritzker. And uh, so good memories. Him. Tom Hines uh, was president of the Senate back in the 70s, and I remember him, which shows I've been do doing this too long, but he was a highly regarded person, uh, I think, in all the jobs and even ran the Cook County Assessor's Office without uh, controversy uh, or significant controversy, which is a, a big thing to do <laughs> for a number of years <laughs> that he did it. Um, and uh, also kind of family, but 
Joe Topinka, the son of Judy Bar Topinka, former Comptroller and Treasurer, uh, who ran as a Republican candidate for governor in 2006, was in town this week to appear outside a building uh, with Comptroller's employees, and Susana Mendoza, the Democrat who now runs the Comptroller's office, was there, and they unveiled a little monument outside the building. Susana Mendoza, Su Susana Mendoza actually wore a Judy Bartow pink dress oh. uh, when she was inaugurated uh, as Comptroller. She loved Judy Bartow pink. She works with Eli's Cheesecake to give away cheesecake one day a year at the State House, just like Judy did for 25 years. Uh, and she said, Judy hated this building, but we're putting the stone out here. We're not naming <laughs> the building for her, but uh, we're doing uh, something to show that we care, and it was like in loving memory of Judy Bartow Pink, it had like a quote. Um, Jeff, it was, it's a Democrat honoring a Republican. Uh, which is always nice to see. Which is always nice to see, and yeah. Mendoza says, I, you know, I'm a real, known to be a bipartisan person, although Bruce Rauner probably wouldn't have considered her that way because she was quite the antagonist when she was the Democratic controller to the Republican governor. Yeah, and I, but, I, that, but she's, you know, she was in the legislature too and used to get sponsors from both sides for her bills. So on newspaper editorial boards, you meet a lot of different uh, Illinois officials through the years and, and Judy Barr Topinka, I think, was one that I remember meeting the most just because how, um, you know, she was just always uh, energetic but also challenging and we would have a lot of kind of arguments back and forth with an editorial board and it was just always interesting when you met her and and I think maybe that's why on both sides I mean she was that way to anyone so maybe that's why somebody from the other political party finds it a little bit easier right. to honor a Republican in that case because she was right. always that way. She was also a journalist for a she long was, time, ran a paper right. and she yeah. drank so much coffee that the, the whole caffeine thing went up at the State House. It's like me with on that, that Mountain Dew. Uh, <laughs> on that note, Brian Mackey, Jeff Rogers, thanks for your help. I'm Bernie Schoenberg, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Capitol View.